announcements for us this morning, and the first one is I think Facebook is fixed, so uh, if you know of anybody that is trying to listen in, I, I believe there is sound, so I'll wait for a thumbs up for somebody later. If not, it is what it is. So uh, just a couple of announcements for us. Uh, the church office will be closed tomorrow for the New Year's holiday, holiday. Uh, so if there are a few things you need to take care of at the office, we're going to need you to take care of them on Tuesday uh, this week. Uh, there is no family night supper, Bible study, RBC kids, or choir rehearsal this Wednesday night. There is choir rehearsal. There is choir rehearsal. Uh, so there you go. Everybody else, there's nothing. Choir, you have rehearsal this week. So there you go. Um, and the last announcement that I have is if you would like to have a poinsettia, they are located in the stairwell near Joy's office, and you can grab one of those following the service. Let's turn our hearts this morning uh, to our reading of Scripture, and this comes from Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. Uh, I'll read out loud for us, but you could follow along on the screens behind me. Matthew 16, beginning in verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our hymn of praise is number 447, Trust and Obey. Let's stand together as we sing.
seated. I can have all of our children come up for our children's time this morning. I thought so too. Well, good morning, guys. It's good to see you all this morning. So, uh, I have a question for you. I don't know if Cayman has an answer to this. Rebecca, you might have an answer to this. Do you have any New Year's resolutions? That's the same answer I got in Sunday school. No New Year's resolutions, nothing you want to change, like maybe listening to your parents more. Can I get an amen from the parents in the back? Amen. Um, Nothing like that? Okay, well, oftentimes people... Uh, we have these New Year's resolutions because we want to change something in our lives. We want to do something in our lives um, that really betters ourselves, maybe betters the people who are around us. Um, And I wanted to read a scripture for you this morning. This is from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. And it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And so the point I want us to hear this morning is that God never changes. And you may think, oh, you know, God doesn't make good changes. God doesn't change things that are bad about himself. Well, God doesn't have anything bad in himself, and so he doesn't need to change anything. He doesn't change his promises. He doesn't change his mind about loving us. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we're going to say a prayer about this, that this morning, and then we're going to go back and sit with our families, okay? So let's say a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. As we go into this new year, help us to realize that and internalize that so that we can be better followers of you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Thank you for that this morning, choir. I, I need to have a little survey, a little lay of the land. How many of you made it to midnight last night, just by show of hands? Midnight last night? I guess the others who have their hands raised are not here. Everybody who has their hands raised, you get a gold star this morning. So thank you for being here with us today. Uh, I'm excited to have the opportunity uh, to preach. But before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we're so thankful uh, to come into this house and to worship you this morning. God, would you open our hearts to be receptive to what you have to say to us this morning? And would you speak so that your words are heard and not my own? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Henri Nouwen wrote in his book, Bread for the Journey, uh, this quote. He says that many people act as if they were simply dropped down in creation and have to entertain themselves until they die. But Christians were sent into the world by God, just as Jesus was. Each of us have a mission in this life. Jesus prays to his Father for his followers, saying, As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. We seldom fully realize that we are sent to fulfill God-given tasks. I think as Christians, it should be our goal, or we could even call it a resolution this year, uh, to be more like Jesus. And we'll see this morning that Jesus was a Messiah who was on a mission, and that we ought to be people of that same mission. And so to do so, I really have three points for us uh, that I want us to look at this morning. We need to know the mission, we need to focus on the mission, and we need to live the mission. If you have your Bibles, it's very important for us to be in Matthew, because we're going to work through this passage uh, with some other ones uh, sprinkled in there as well. And this is Matthew chapter 16, uh, verses 21 through 28, and I'm going to read it again for us. Scripture says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed on the third day and be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And so to be like Jesus this morning, we need to be completely dedicated to our mission. And to do that, we must know our mission. And we'll see that this mission was necessary for Jesus to do. And so as we read through the gospel accounts of Jesus' life, it's easy to see that Jesus was a Messiah who was specifically on a mission for something. Jesus' mission was very clear all throughout his life. And he knew what it was, and he never strayed from his mission. But not only that, Jesus made it clear to his disciples the full extent of his mission. In verse 21, again, it says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. Now in Scripture, this is the first time that we have in Matthew where Jesus specifically lays out that his mission was to suffer and to die on the cross. He knew that he had to die, why he had to die, and how he would die. 
I love reading other translations of Scripture when I'm going through work uh, on a sermon or a lesson or anything like that. Uh, other translations, they say that Jesus told his disciples plainly what his mission was. Scripture also tells us that Jesus must die on the cross. It was inevitable for, for him to die in this way, and the gospel message is incomplete without the picture of the cross. Uh, I remember being in college, we had this uh, student union at UNC Pembroke uh, where everybody would come and they'd bring their game systems, they'd bring their card games, uh, and really they would hang out there all day long. Um, I really feel like some of those kids that were there didn't really go to class. Um, but one time coming back from the cafeteria, uh, me and one of my good friends, Kyle, uh, were like, hey, we have nothing else to do. Uh, let's go hang out, let's go play some video games and, and see what's what out there. Now, one thing about Kyle uh, that Kyle always had around his neck uh, was a black necklace with a little silver cross on it. And he wore that with him everywhere that he went. Uh, so when we decided to go to the student union, kind of hang out there for that day, um, we were hanging out with this group of people, and this girl pointed to the cross on Kyle's necklace and was just like, hey, why do you wear that? And so, you know, Kyle was a new Christian at the time, so he was very excited to say, hey, it's a good reminder for me. Um, I love that I'm a Christian, and so I can have that. Uh, I like it as a good reminder for myself. Um, and then she re replied with something that I think about often. She said, why would you want to be reminded of Jesus' brutal death? I think that this comment... Uh, I think about it often when I see crosses out in the community, whether it's on a necklace, uh, whether it's on the back of somebody's car. Um, this form of the cross for this non-believer, for this, this girl that we happened to stumble upon, was something completely foreign to her, and she only knew a little bit about it. She knew that the cross meant a brutal death. Now, the cross during Jesus' day was the most scandalous form of criminal execution. Even the term of the cross sounded terrible to those who would hear it. And we may not blame the disciples if they had hoped that Jesus was speaking metaphorically. Jesus continues in verse 21, and he, and he says, And suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes. Now the word that Jesus used here, the suffer, that he uses, means more than dying. The suffering would include persecution and rejection by the Jews, by Jesus' own people. The elders, the priests, and the teachers were the three groups of the Sanhedrin, and they were responsible for all of the spiritual life in Israel. Jesus then tells him that he would be killed and on the third day be raised. For Jesus, he was not viewed as a revolutionary liberator, but as a suffering Messiah and something that even his own disciples had great difficulty fathoming. And since Jesus knew that he was on a mission and that this mission was necessary for him, nothing would deter him from that mission. Jesus knew that this mission that he was called to be would be a difficult one, but it was also a necessary one. And so for us to be like Jesus, we have to be completely dedicated to our mission. And as Christians, we must understand that we have a mission, and I think it's best summed up in the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I think this is one of those scriptures that uh, sometimes in Christian life we can become numb to hearing it. You hear it so many times, you grow up with it. It's a very uh, central one in a lot of, uh, of kids' curriculum. Uh, a lot of vacation Bible schools, this is always kind of wrapped up in there. We hear this scripture sometimes and we think that this is a command only for pastors and only for ministers. But Jesus wants 
helped us to know that this mission is for anyone who calls themselves a Christian, anyone who calls themselves a follower of Jesus. You don't have to have a Bible college degree to tell someone about Jesus. You don't have to have a seminary degree to invite someone to church. You just have to have a personal relationship with Jesus and a willing heart to serve. Now, Jesus challenges us to make disciples, and that is the only central command that he gives here in Matthew 28 when he talks about the Great Commission. He says that the commission is to make disciples. It's not to talk about Jesus. It's not to preach the gospel. It's not to make converts, to start churches. Although, obviously, all of that is assumed in making disciples. To make disciples is to make converts and to lead them in the journey to spiritual maturity. That is what Jesus is calling us to do in the Great Commission. The commission to make disciples is amplified in three different phrases that tell the disciples how to fulfill their tasks. Jesus says, by going, by baptizing, and by teaching. Specifically, Jesus' followers make disciples by going to the world, not by waiting for the world to come to them. So you must Go if you want to make disciples. Then after that, we must baptize them. The commission to baptize shows the apostles uh, that they make disciples by calling converts to publicly identify with Jesus by baptism into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's why I love having baptism service when they're in front of the entire congregation. It is a symbolic symbol to show all of us about the inward change. It's an outward expression of an inward change is what I've always grown up hearing it explained as. It's a good reminder to show people that you have made this change and this commitment in your life. So you must go, you must baptize, and then we make disciples by teaching them to observe and obey all that Jesus has commanded us. The term all here is a really intensified version of every last thing. The scope of the Great Commission is manifest in the the repetition of the word all. Jesus has all authority. His followers make disciples of all nations by teaching all that Jesus commands empowered by his presence, always. That is very important for us to know with our mission. And we should also see that our mission is the Great Commission, but our our mission is also one that is of great importance. It is necessary. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? If we don't tell others, they will not hear. If we do not tell others about Jesus, they will not know. If we do not tell others about Jesus, they will not come. And if we do not tell others about Jesus, they are going to hell. Our mission is, is important. It is necessary in our lives. And I think it's a challenge for all of us in 2023 to sit there and realize the importance of that mission. Our mission carries with it a grave responsibility. God's commands are not an option and they are not a choice. He has commanded us to share the gospel with anyone who will listen. Now that we know our mission, we know how our mission is necessary and how it carries with us uh, some responsibility. Uh, The second point that we need to accomplish is that we need to focus on the mission. And you're going to find this in Matthew 16, verses 22 through 23. Verse 22 says, And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, 
This shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are a hindrance to me. You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. I think that sometimes Satan uses those who are closest to us uh, to try to derail us from our mission. And I think Jesus was no exception in the Bible. Matthew tells us that Peter took Jesus aside and really began to rebuke him for saying such things. Jesus, just before this, had called Peter the rock that he was going to build his church upon. But here you have this rock that becomes a stumbling stone for Jesus. The idea of of rebuke that Peter has doesn't really um, indicate anger. Jesus isn't really angry at uh, at Peter. It's given this serious expression of warning. What Peter really is laying out and saying is this. He is saying, by the grace of God, may he stop this from happening to you. Peter was feeling a genuine concern for Jesus' safety, and his counsel came out out of a loving and a sincere heart. However, being loving and sincere is not always enough unless you couple it with understanding. Peter is not speaking only for himself, but he's speaking for all of the disciples. Uh, If you look at Scripture, you can see that Peter is like the talking head of disciples. If one of them is going to say something, they're kind of nudging Peter, like, hey, why don't you tell him this? And I guess Peter was the only brave one to actually do that. But for the disciples, Jesus' mission was not a goal to be fulfilled, but a disaster to be avoided. However, Jesus was not going to lose focus, or Jesus wasn't going to be derailed from the mission that he had. He says to Peter, he says, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter's revelation of Jesus came from the Father, but his rebuke of Jesus came from his own sinful heart. For God's purposes, the cross had to come before the crown. So the rebuke that Peter receives from Jesus was immediate and it was direct. Now, Peter had not become Satan. It's so easy for us to think about the idea of a a person of Satan. But here, what Jesus is doing, uh, the word Satan can be translated to mean direct adversary. And Peter was trying to hinder the plan of God, and he was becoming an offense. He was becoming a direct adversary to Jesus and Jesus' mission. Peter was trying to divert Jesus' attention from his mission in a similar way Satan did when Jesus was taken away to the wilderness after his baptism. But Jesus remained focused on the mission. I believe that one of the biggest hindrances we face in our churches today comes from Christians who confessed Christ but who think like the world. And we cannot allow anyone, no matter who it is, to distract us from the mission that God has called us to do. And we stay focused in our mission, uh, as Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We shouldn't look to the world to be focused. We shouldn't look to our friends to be focused. We shouldn't look to our family to be focused. We need to look to Jesus in order to be focused on our mission. And we stay focused through our faith in Him. So we have learned that we have a mission Then we saw that we should focus on the mission. And lastly, I want us to see this morning that we should live the mission. And this comes from verses 24 through 28 of Matthew 16. Scripture says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Just as Jesus refused to avoid his cross, he declares that if we are going to be focused and live out our mission, we cannot avoid the cross either. He tells his disciples plainly, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The cross is something that is not optional for us. It is impossible for us as Christians to follow Jesus without taking up the cross. We must die to our own desires and follow the example that Jesus has given us. I think it is natural uh, thinking to look for the easier way out of things. And because of that, we must deny ourselves. Jesus says to take up his cross. Now, although this image is often understood uh, by modern society as bearing up under some personal hardship in life, as used here by Jesus, the cross has a much more profound significance. In order to take up your cross, you must die to your own will and take upon yourself God's will. Jesus then says why it's important for us to take up our cross. In verse 25, he says, Forever, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Losing one's life means to give up our lesser existence for something that is far greater in our lives. Like the girl at school talking to my friend Kyle we move from the world's way of thinking about the cross as a form of punishment and turn to looking at it in light of what Jesus has done for us. And our life is simply won by giving it over to Jesus. Our life is lost by selfishly trying to save it. For us, taking up our cross means not making it the object that saves our life, or the things that make it up. The cross is a place of death, and we must put to death our old life. Jesus tells us that taking up our cross only makes good sense. He says in verse 26, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? The heart of this passage is losing one's life. Everyone not willing to lose their life for the sake of the gospel will lose it when Jesus comes back again. We must decide whether we want to come after Jesus or we want to save our lives. We can't have it both ways, church. The cross for us means death and it means nothing less than that in our lives. Gaining all the world has to offer cannot match the riches of finding true life through obeying God's will and following Jesus. And at the end of our life, we are each measured by the health of our souls, not the wealth of our estates. And if we want to be a follower of Jesus, taking up our cross is essential. Luke chapter 14, verse 27 says, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. A crossless Christian, catch those words, a crossless Christian is a contradiction in terms. You cannot be a Christian and not take up your cross. You cannot be a Christian and live by your own will. You cannot be a Christian and not change 
your life. Taking up our cross means total and complete surrender to God's will. Would you join me in a word of prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, uh, starting off this new year, you, you give us a challenge this morning. God, we see reflected throughout Scripture that we've learned today that your Son came here for a reason. He knew what his reason was, and he knew what his mission was, and he wasn't going to deter from that mission. God, in that same way, we should follow in those same steps. We should know that our mission is to make disciples. And God, as we go into this year of 2023, uh, I, I, maybe I speak for myself, but I don't want to do the same things that I've been doing. God, I want to make disciples. I want to bring more people closer to you. And God, challenge us in our lives to take up our cross, deny ourselves to the things that we want to do, and to follow you and what you want to do for our, your kingdom, ultimately. God, we love you, and we're so thankful uh, for the opportunity to come together and to worship you this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Jesus is a Messiah who was on a mission. He knew his mission, he focused on his mission, and he lived out his mission. And we too must follow in those same steps. Are you ready to pick up your cross? Are you focused on our mission as Christians? Do you want to be one of his disciples? Our invitational hymn this morning is hymn number 285, Wherever He Leads. Maybe this morning for you, he's leading you to come to the altar and lay down everything you did in 2022 and rededicate your life in a way that you live for him in 2023. I'll be down front. Uh, you're more than welcome to pray with me. You're more than welcome to come up and pray by yourself. Maybe you're in this church building today and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The altar is open. The cross is for all of us. I would love to sit down and talk to you about that. I know Debbie would love to sit down and talk to you about that. You can come up during the front during this time, during our invitational hymn. But whatever decision you make, as Christians we should deny ourselves and take up our cross. Our invitational hymn again is 285, Wherever He Leads, as we stand together and we sing. been good to worship with you all uh, this morning, church. Again, Happy New Year.
to you. I hope that 2023 is a year filled with following God's mission. Uh, Receive this benediction. As we leave from here today, let us focus on our mission, understand our mission, and live out our mission. Amen.